were singing those last two songs, I was thinking of the Kramers, the Georges, who are welcoming new babies into this world. And I'm thinking, what a gift, what a privilege for, for them and us to do the very things we're, we're singing, right? To look to God in ways that these children grow up, not just in homes, but amongst other believers where they're seeing the truth of who Jesus is lived out in ways that they're going, I want, I, I want to follow Jesus too, right? Uh, may the Lord help us do that. What, a, what an awesome gift uh, and privilege to have young children growing up in our midst and, and to uh, point them to Jesus in those ways. If you are an older child or someone new here uh, this morning, a guest, a special welcome to you. My name is Tom Davisinskis. I'm the interim pastor here and uh, we're delighted that you've chosen to spend this time together and uh, do pray that this would be an experience where you continually discover God's love, discover his family here at North Point in a way that maybe you say, I want to be part of that as well. This church family, following Jesus. Yeah, being part of that. Well, we're in a uh, series called Soul Habits where we're looking at foundational habits that God develops in us. Foundational habits that God develops in us through the circumstances of our lives, the good parts, the hard parts, the people around us in ways that redirect us, in ways that redeem what's gone on, the bad choices we, we might make. Foundational habits that God develops that helps us live into all that he created us to be. We started off by looking at the habits of repentance and belief Oftentimes, you know, repentance gets a, a bad name. It's like, oh, but you think about it, you're turning towards the good things God would want <laughs> from those lesser things. Or the, the next habit we looked at is discovering our identity and all that God created us to be. And today we're wrapping up that series by looking at the final habit, that of discovering what God is calling us or who God is calling us to be and what he's calling us to do. You know, it's a great question to return to periodically. I found myself right when I was a very young believer to all throughout, even down to this past year, coming back to those questions. God, what are you calling me? What are you calling us to be about it and to do in this situation, in this time, in this phase of life? What are you calling me and us to be about and do? Now, part of this question is constant no matter what, right? Right? No matter what situation we're in, you can guarantee that at the heart of God is the desire, the invitation, the, the calling for you to discover more of his love, to rest in that, or as the scripture would say, to abide and be with God. What an awesome privilege. The creator of the universe calling us, inviting us, and saying, I just want to be with you. I want you to experience my love. I want you to not only just know it, but grow in that. And let it change who you are. Enjoying that relationship. I love as the Westminster uh, Confession says, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Or John Piper adds a little different uh, preposition in the middle there. He says, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Isn't that great? So, in this relationship with God, who are we then called to be? In response to this time with God, what does that look like? That will vary from each person and the way God's made them and each situation we face. That calling will look different. I love NPC's mission statement. I think it's put in just great contemporary words, words that align with the truth of Scripture, that we want to be a people who are following Jesus in the company of friends, for our own sake and all the good things that come to us. No, for the sake of others. So practically, what does that look like, though? For each of us in the situations we're facing, say, in the workplace, how is God calling you to be about that for there? Or with family members? Or in the community or with those people who are very different than you? What does that look like for each of us? Individually and together. It will vary person to person, situation to situation. We started this new feature in uh, MPC's E News. Maybe you've seen it. If not, I think you can still go back and you'll see it in upcoming weeks. I've asked different staff and, and elders to share 
how they feel God's calling them in this season, in the very particulars before them. If you didn't see the article written by Keith Heino, it's worth going back real quick and right to the heart of something great about what it looks like to follow God. So I invite you to be looking at those, both looking back, but going forward. So there's that individual component, responding to God's calling. But then there is, and I think this is the more difficult and exciting one, is there's that part of us as a community. We're following Jesus in the community of friends. There was a community of friends that 20 years ago were very clear and passionate about God's calling to start a church. We now are sitting in that church building amongst the church family enjoying these people that heard and responded to God's calling, not just individually, never could happen just individually, but together. Now, we have that opportunity to look forward again. We're in that season of change to say, God, where are you calling us to go? Who are you calling us to be as a church family in the next 10, 20 years? Session is grappling with this, praying through this. You'll have a chance to join in that as we get this mission study in the upcoming month. Who is God calling us to be together? And today's scripture, I pray, is something that in this moment, in the years ahead, is something we keep coming back to because it's got incredible guidance and truth for us in that journey, in that adventure, about how we can live out our calling individually and together. It's one of those passages that I would encourage you to memorize. Memorize not so you get a star by your name, but memorize so you're just constantly thinking about it, realizing what's said, applying it in different ways. Now, over the next 20 minutes, buckle up, okay? We're going to dive in and move forward over a lot of territory. But I don't want you to go at the end and go, wow, that was really good. What, uh, what did he say? <laughs> what I want you to do is not just pay attention to me, pay attention to God, more importantly. As we go through this, pay attention to something that's going to stick out to you how God wants to speak to you, call you personally, and call us as a church family through what we're going to read today. All right? Sound good? You're, you're on board? See, let's buckle. We're, we're going to go over a lot of great stuff. All right, so soul habits. We're looking at our calling. Turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. As we discussed last week, there's some pretty chaotic and tragic things happening during the time of these verses we're going to read uh, in here in Luke 4, babies have been massacred, not just one, but many. Kings are behaving badly, right? Murdering their own family members, their, their children. This King Herod murdering his own wife. Great spiritual leaders are locked up in prison for what they're saying and doing. The Savior of the world, Jesus himself, goes home at the end of this chapter only to be driven out of town with the hopes of pushing them off of a cliff. Now, in chaotic times like this, we tend to naturally respond one of three different ways. You'll see this up on the screen right now. First of all, there's the flight, fight reaction, and then the freeze. That's naturally just how we would respond. And the faithful people in this day are responding in similar ways, right? There's the zealots, okay? These are people who are literally fighting against foreigners who would corrupt the religion of the Jewish people. They're literally fighting against the oppressive Roman government. And then there's the Essenes, kind of people like John the Baptist. I don't think he was an Essene, but he behaved in this way, where in some ways he pulled back from that community. He's fleeing from the chaos around, and these Essenes would go to caves, and they had kind of a monkish community and existence there. The zealots fighting, the Essenes fleeing, and I think the Sadducees and Pharisees can represent what I call that freeze response, where they're staying put and they're like a deer in the headlights going, okay, now what do we do here? Wow, this is really different. God, what do you want us to be about? And the Sadducees, okay, the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife. That's why they were sad, you see. I know, really corny, I just couldn't resist, right? And interesting, I was reading about how archaeologists would, would find these different communities and the notes communities by the writings and everything, and these were guys apparently who were living it up, you know, to find a, a place where a Sadducee was, etc. and there's lots of gold ornaments and stuff that they're recovering from it. They're like, hey, we're not going to live beyond this life, so let's live it up right now. And the Pharisees, 
The Pharisees were different, that their focus was on strict adherence to moral laws. As we look at what's coming next, I can even see Jesus speaking into each one of these, right? And his words about, you know, not relying on provision. He's saying things to hopefully correct those uh, Sadducees, right? Or as he talks about living by faith versus what we might call a legalism. I can see how he's speaking to those Pharisees. How might he want to speak to us? You see, all these groups I've just mentioned had one thing in common. They wanted to preserve what was distinctively Jewish and their Jewish culture from this outside foreign influence. And they had different ideas, these fight, flight, and freeze type responses on how that was going to be accomplished. And in comes Jesus, who's going to teach a different way of faithfully responding. You follow along as I read from Luke 4, verses 1 through 13. We're going to see Jesus both being tempted away from what God's calling him to, but in that process, clarifying what God's called him to be about. Verse 1 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry, I bet. The devil said to him, if you are a son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. So then the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil then led to, uh, Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift up their heads so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And again, Jesus answered from scripture, he said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Here are four things I want you to hold on to. Remember, again, be paying attention not to me, but maybe, not maybe, definitely the Lord wants to speak to and encourage you as well. So what is that? First of all is this. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and then was led by the Spirit into temptation, to face temptation. then don't miss the good things that come as a result of that. Number two, there is an enemy. Here it's called devil. It's, it's referred by Satan, but don't get tied up on these pictures of little pitchforks and red pointy horns. I love the picture we see here where there is an enemy who wants to turn Jesus' attention away from trusting God. That's how the enemy works. It works in the most subtle of ways distorting truth just ever so slightly, even as we see Satan here taking Scripture and then twisting it just ever so slightly out of context. And number three, Jesus overcomes. He overcomes these temptations by knowing scriptural truth, by listening to God in the midst of those temptations. And number four, the devil flees, right? When Jesus resists, the devil's out of there. It says in verse 22, the devil left until another opportune time. Faith will always, always overcome the lies, the temptation, the chaos that the enemy will bring into our life. Always. So what does that look like for us? How might God want to be encouraging us with these truths? Well, first of all, God will allow us as well to be tempted. And I encourage you to not fight not flee, not freeze like the deer in the headlights, but look to God. Trust him. Respond faithfully to what he's going to put on your heart. First Peter 4.12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. It's like, wait a minute, what's this? No, no. <laughs> Jesus promised there would be the temptation, but rejoice knowing that God will use those to bring about good in your life, even as we see in Jesus' life. 
There's a God who is more powerful. There's a God who redeems. There's a God who uses the difficult temptations in our life to help us understand more of who we are as his children, more of what it means to follow him. There is an enemy. There is an enemy who wants to separate us from God. I pray that we can see in Jesus and be encouraged to know that the importance of knowing Scripture. Have you taken time to memorize, meditate on Scripture? Not just hear it from up here, but really is, what is it the psalmist says, hide God's word in your heart and then follow it. Follow it in the times when it makes sense. Follow it especially in the times when it doesn't. And you're feeling like, okay, this is not my idea. This is not my desire. Or especially when you're going, oh, this isn't comfortable. God will still lead you, especially in times like that, in ways that are essential to us understanding who he is. Living out his calling to help other people understand who he is. And please, <laughs> please know this. As you read these scriptures, we see in Jesus him resisting temptation. The Bible tells us the same spirit that dwelled in Jesus, that helped him raise from the dead, Romans 8, dwells in you and I if we've trusted our life to Christ. And so we too can resist, can say no to any temptation that comes our way. Because the reality is, catch this, the enemy is weaker than the God who calls us, who is present with us. The enemy will flee. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee. And then that whole language of opportune time in verse 22. I've learned this uh, from being around some faithful brothers and sisters who are fighting the temptations in their life, be it drugs or alcohol or different behavior that they might find themselves tripping up in repeatedly. And one of the things they've learned is they trip up during these times where they're hungry, or I like to put hurting, times when they're angry, times when they're feeling lonely, and just when they're tired. And they remember this through HALT, H-A-L-T. Those are the opportune times when the enemy wants to strike, when our, our defenses are down, when we're feeling bad about ourselves or our life, or we're just flat out tired, we're hurting, we're angry, we're lonely, we're tired, and the devil says, hmm, there's an opportunity. So when we find ourselves in those, let it be an opportunity to look to God. Say, all right, I'm hurting, I'm lonely, I'm tired, I need you, Jesus. Guard my heart and my mind in you, Jesus, in the midst of this time. And he will, and the enemy will flee. I've included in your sermon notes another summary that uh, I, I draw your attention to. So if you want to look at that just really quick. Um, again, I said there's a lot here that we're not going to be able to cover. And, and we'll touch on some of this. But it's the difference between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. In the scripture, we're seeing that highlighted. The kingdom of man is all about personal achievement. What, what you can do, what I can do. If you're hungry, you turn it into stone. I mean, you turn the stone into bread, right? It's the very first temptation. Jesus resists the devil by recognizing, no, this is about the kingdom of man and how man operates. I'm going to be about the kingdom of God and how God operates. And so we see him in each of these temptations turning to Scripture to get that perspective versus his own human perspective or his own human tendency or, or what we would say life is all about as men. And we see it in the very first temptation. When the devil wants him to turn the stone into bread, he goes to Deuteronomy 8.3, if you want to jot that down. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. See, that first temptation is all about achieving earthly provision. God provides. There's nothing wrong about that. But the question is, do we wait on his timing and his ways, or do we try to control that on our own? Where might we be tempted to control the external circumstances of our lives to get the provision we want, when we want it? I'm thinking of conversations with a friend who realized that, you know, he was ever so slightly fudging on his expense report at work. Just saying, you know what? I got a car, I got a family. Come on, they're making millions. 
They give me a little bit more here. And God convicted his heart of that. He's trying to control stuff instead of waiting on God's provision, God's ways. I think a subtle one that I've heard a lot of people fall into, and I definitely have fallen into myself, is thinking that it's up to us, and so we just keep working harder and harder and more and more hours. When I first started my career, I found myself working about 80 hours, wanting to see the provision of very good things, people coming to know God and follow God, but I was feeling like it's all up to me to control the circumstances and create an environment where that's going to happen. It's not how God works. And we see Jesus resisting that temptation of earthly provision and the means of control, and instead turning to Jesus. The next temptation, if you're looking at there, is all about personally achieving, I like to say, power. They'll say, see all these kingdoms? Man, all these positions of power, they can be yours for just $9.99. <laughs> all the authority can be yours, Jesus. One small little thing, you just need to Look to me, trust me, instead of God. <laughs> and he does it again through twisting scripture and taking scripture out of context. But Jesus once again returns to scripture and says, no, I'm not going to try to uh, gain earthly power. I want to continually trust God and his power and in his ways. You know, as I, I think of this, okay, so what does this look like for us? Where might we be tempted? I'll keep going, just uh, using myself as a wonderful example here of what not to do. But yeah, with my kids, both when they're young and now especially as they're making big decisions that, and they're out of the house, I have to fight that temptation to control, right? I mean, we're called to prevent, protect, provide, and to guide. Make no mistake about that. But where do we slide over into trying to control what's going on? Maybe even for very good reasons. Or when we see people hurting around us, a codependent type response would be, okay, I'm going to rescue them. <laughs> I'm going to control the circumstance versus encourage them, pray for them, help them see what it means to trust Jesus. So the first temptation is one for earthly provision. The next is for earthly power positions of power, ways of executing power that are separate from trusting God. And the final temptation is all about achieving popularity. Okay? So you've got provision, power, and popularity. What other people might think. How to impress them. And I said, hey, Jesus, just get up on that temple, throw yourself down, and then everyone would surely worship you. And remember, God says he's going to take care of you. Isn't that wonderful? Miraculous signs that impress people, but impressing them leave them short of trusting God. I find it fascinating that after many of the miracles that Jesus performs in the Gospels, we'll see him coming up as we go through Luke. Afterwards, he goes, shh, don't tell anyone. Why do you think that is? I'll give you a little clue, because he realized... That's not the real best thing. <laughs> That's just a sign pointing to what's better. That's the relationship with God. A God who loves us, sacrifices for, for us, and is graciously with us. How might we be drawn to other people's opinions of us or gaining that popularity in different ways instead of trusting God? The kingdom of man will always be about behavior modification. The kingdom of God is all about mind and heart and I would say life transformation. Transformation that comes through a relationship with God. So now that Jesus has clarified what he's saying, we're not called to do these things or be these type of people. Focusing on the kingdom man, no, we are to be focused on the kingdom of God. He turns his attention to further clarify, clarify what we are called to be about. Look at Luke 4, verses 14 through 22, and follow along as I read that now for us as well. Scriptures say that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Let me just pause there. Did you catch that? 
he went into, led into this time in the desert by the Spirit. And he's coming out in the power of the Spirit because he said no. As you say no to sin and temptation, there is a strengthening within your heart and soul. And even, yes, news about Jesus spread throughout the whole countryside, the scriptures say. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing all these things, even as I'm reading again. I mean, how easy it would have been for him to just sell out. Yet, as he's faithful, there are the people who recognize it on their own. Anyway, so... Verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. We know from looking at it, this is Isaiah 61. So unrolling that scroll, he found the place where it was written, Isaiah 61, and read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, though. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All people spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And they also said, but isn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> Jesus is announcing that Old Testament prophecy is being fulfilled by him in their very midst. The poor, the, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed are going to hear the good news of God's grace. They are going to experience freedom. Many experience the freedom, both physically, all given the chance to experience freedom, spiritually speaking. And again, as I had mentioned earlier, every single time there is a physical freedom that happens, as we'll see people who are paralyzed being able to walk. Note how Jesus will always come back and point to the spiritual freedom that is theirs because of his gracious presence with them. That's the really, really good news. People who've been set free to now enjoy a God who loves them sacrificially. The good news that they can be at peace with God. The Jewish word for that is shalom. Total and complete well-being. Not the absence of conflict as we might define peace. But in the midst of conflict, knowing it's all good because God's all present with us. The good news is that those poor, those oppressed, those blind, those prisoners are in a relationship with God that no matter what the situation and circumstance, they can live rightly with God in a way that's a witness to others about the God who is present and gracious. But see, there's a righteousness that is far different and better than anything the world would say you could do or we could achieve on our own. As we trust God, his spirit helps us live rightly with him and live rightly in community with others in a way that blesses anyone that sees and interacts. Again, we see that the kingdom of God is not about changing the external circumstances around us, but it involves that inner, internal change of our heart and our minds and our very lives. God isn't interested in controlling you and me. I think it's interesting that the very freedom he gives comes with free will. That even as we've been set free from ways that have bound us, ways we've been blind to the truth of God, we're set free and still able to say no to God. <laughs> wow. God given us a freedom to continue to follow him or to choose not to. So what does this good news look like for you with your family as your work as someone in the Coast Guard or the politics or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it might be? What does it look like for you to live out what we're seeing Jesus speak about? No way that in this moment I, I could describe that. Hopefully the scripture begins to point to that for you. Hopefully you're seeing that and going, this is a fun adventure. 
day by day discovering what it means to say no to the kingdom of man, say yes to God's kingdom, God's ways, it's God himself through the practical things that you face each day. Uh, it was, what, a couple weeks ago, middle of December, there was this little uh, approach, a habit I'll call a tool, that, um, again, as I'm studying scripture, I'm coming back to and realizing the, the value of mm -hmm. it. You might remember that tool because we had a really uh, fun, high-tech way, a sound effect that went with it. Do you remember? Snap. Snapping out of it. Snapping into it. What, what, what God, what, so those of you that weren't here, S-N-A-P. It's an acronym. Okay? The S stands for stop. Whatever you're doing, just stop. The N stands for, we're still learning it, okay? <laughs> Notice. Notice what's going on for you. What are you thinking, feeling? What are you believing? A, ask God what he would have you thinking, feeling, and believing with what's before you and who you are in that. And the P, I know it's an athletic term, pivot. You think of that as you're watching the games today. Pivot. Turn from what you're doing and instead align yourself, turn to what God would have you do. Fancy biblical word is repentance for that. Pivot. Repent, believe. Trusting, not the ways of the world, but our identity in Christ. Trusting not the ways of the world, the popularity, the provision, the power that we're so prone to focus on and say, no, I'm going to follow the God who loves me and has called me to follow him to serve and to bless others. We want to snap. There you go, a couple. That's all right. That'll be, that'll be good. We want to snap out of our behavior of following our own ways, the ways of the world, and like Jesus, continually turn to God, saying no to the ways of the world, saying yes to the incredible adventure of following Jesus in ways where little Babies get to see Jesus and, and grow up in that love. Where people going through incredible, difficult circumstances realize that there's a God who's with them working in the midst of that. Ways where people are off saying and doing things that just harm others, that defame the name of Jesus, and that those people, like Paul, would turn and trust Christ. I don't know about you, but there is nothing that compares to seeing those things happen. To get to be a part, to join in what God's doing in this world as we see the ways of heaven being manifest right around us as the kingdom of God is coming. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and in my life and in the situations around us as a church. Just like it is in heaven. You know, as I, I looked at this passage, interesting, Jesus had his own kind of extended time where there's a whole lot of snapping going on, right? Think about it. He stopped. I mean, life as he knew it stopped, and he's out in the desert. And he's noticing, or, and noticed not only for himself, but he's so kind to share with someone who then captured it in these scriptures, noticing what's going on. Oh, okay, there's an enemy here. I'm being pulled to go do these things which are far short of the good things God said, right? He's noticing that, oh, I resist and this guy's taken off. This is good. He's noticing all that. And again, A, he's asking God. He's uh, aligning himself with God's will, right? He's coming back to Scripture. He's listening to God. Stop, notice, ask a line, and then this word kind of breaks down because Jesus, I believe, and scriptures would say is without sin. So he didn't need to repent. But he just kept on that journey of trusting who God was and what God was calling him to be. Tempted, no doubt, but kept on trusting the Lord. So as you think about this, as I said, we're covering a whole lot of territory. Let me come back and just close with saying this. Where, where is God speaking to you this morning as you listen to all this? What's maybe one thing that stuck out to you? Hold on to it. Trust God with that. Maybe it's that you're going to take a little time to snap. 
Not like just like this, but, but take some time as we've just described. I know one of the things for me, maybe some of you would be uh, encouraged to do the same, is I want to memorize Luke 4, 18 through 19. And just let that be on the top of my mind as I'm interacting with people, as I'm in situations. I, I've listed on the bottom of your sermon notes two other ways. We need each other. We need each other right here. We need the larger body of Christ encouraging us in this journey. We're following Jesus in the company of friends right around us as well as beyond that. Here, here are two friends, two authors that have greatly encouraged me. Both these books I read probably about 20 years ago over the last few months. I'm reading them again and I'm going, this is really helpful in living out what we're talking about today, right? Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey, uh, Resident Aliens, both books written at least 20 years ago, but definitely as I come back to them today, matter of fact, I was with a friend the other day, I said, you gotta read this, this is great. You and I were in seminary together when we had read some of those, what, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and then as in our upcoming sermon series, we're gonna continue through the, the book of Luke, and what's cool is we will begin to see Jesus living out the very things he's just spoken to. Seeing the good news is he's dealing with paralyzed people and, well, show up in the upcoming weeks. That'll be part of the fun. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this company of friends. Thank you for scripture. Thank you for your loving presence with us. God, I pray that you would help us Help us not just in this time, although what a gift it is. May you grant us the, the grace of time with you throughout the week where we get to continually listen to who you've called us to be with the people and situations that are before us. What a privilege to get to abide and be with you, Father, all throughout our days. What a, what a, a privilege to see you, Spirit, Stir our hearts and minds to how we might respond just like you, Jesus. Just like you in a way that we and others discover the incredible good news that you died to bring us. You died to give us poor, blind, oppressed people. Thank you, Father. We love you again in this day. We surrender our lives to you in the name of Jesus and for your glory.